Good afternoon and welcome to Sandals Church, man. I'm glad you guys are here. I hope you guys are ready, man, and, and I'm just excited about the lives that have already been changed uh, this weekend and those people who have made decisions to get real in terms of their relationship with God. And look, that's our vision here at Sandals Church. We don't want to play games. I mean, obviously, I'm not into, you know, a lot of religious pomp and circumstance. That's not who I am. That's not who we are. And that's not who God is. God cares about you, loves you, and wants a real relationship with you. And I want to talk to those of you who maybe are, are far from God or don't believe in God or have never encountered God in your life. I want to start with you because a lot of times we can become skeptical and not believe in God simply because we haven't had a personal encounter and we've never seen him or experienced him. Some of you are like, well, maybe God's made up or I went to church once and I didn't see God and I didn't experience God and I didn't feel God. And I want you to know that just because you haven't seen him doesn't mean that he didn't see you. Uh, this past week, man, there's a great article. It's floating around the internet. And it's, uh, it's a real story. It's a true story about a 10-year-old boy that went surfing with his dad this week in Australia. Some of you have probably seen the pictures. And the dad was on the shore like a proud dad taking pictures of his son ripping up the wave. And everything was great. And nobody thought anything was wrong until they went home and developed the film. And when they went home and developed the film, remember, the boy never saw a shark. The boy never knew there was a shark close to him. The boy never experienced a shark. And when they took the pictures of the boy shredding up this wave, here is a great white shark literally within a foot in the striking position to attack and bite this kid. And here's what was amazing to me as I was reading the article, because people were just like, oh my gosh, this is so scary. Some of you are like, that's why I don't ever go in the water. I'm never going there. And so here's what... Literally, uh, 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 um, oh my mind, uh, a microbiologist who studies oceanography, uh, this is what he said. He said, people encounter great white sharks all the time. People who go in the water, people who surf, people who swim in the ocean encounter great white sharks all the time. Just because you didn't see it doesn't mean it didn't see you. And now you're like, that settles it. I'm never ever going in the water again. I saw Jaws change my life, right? Listen. Man, I want you to know that some of you are in a spiritual ocean right now and you don't know it. And you're swimming and you're floating and something powerful is gonna draw near you. And you may not see him, you may not experience him, but he's there. And he's gonna come up and he's gonna bump you, not to devour you, but to save you. And I want you to know that God created the great white shark. God is the all powerful, almighty one. I mean, he's the one who said, let's make it big with teeth and white so you can see it. He's the one that did that, but God loves you and has a plan for your life. And I'm gonna talk today about how to get real with him. So let's begin with a word of prayer and let's pray together and ask God to join us so that people who are far from God can get close to him in Jesus' name today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for all those who are present, God. I just pray that you anoint them with your love, your presence, and your power. Lord, I pray today that we are, as we are floating in the oceans of life, you would just pull up next to us and bump us. God, warn us today. Give us an opportunity to get our, get, get our lives right, God. I pray that you would bless my words, God, in our ears so that we can hear your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let's take a look on our outlines. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to the most important encounter with God in the history of man. This encounter with God will forever change the way human beings know God, see God, and experience God. It was a couple thousand years ago, out in the desert in the middle of nowhere, there's a guy who wrecked his life. He'd made some mistakes. Anybody made some mistakes in life? Raise your hands, okay? You don't have to say what they are, but made some mistakes. He screwed up, man. He was born into a life of privilege. God literally had blessed him. Moses was designated to be aborted right after birth. Literally after birth, Israeli women were to abort their children and kill their kids. But Moses' sister came up with a plan. I'll save him and I'll put him in a little reed basket and I'm gonna send him down the Nile River in the direction of Pharaoh's daughters. And one of Pharaoh's daughters saw this little basket and saved this little baby and raised him as her own. He was raised as a king of Egypt, born a Hebrew slave, raised as a king of Egypt. He was a son of privilege, had everything there for him. And one day, man, his anger got the best of him. And he killed a guy, literally killed a guy and buried him in the sand and thought he got away with it. But he didn't get away with it. And so he ran. He fled from his house of, 
privilege. He was a son of the king and now his life was in danger by the king. He went from being a child of Pharaoh to literally Pharaoh's next victim. And so he fled into the wilderness and he thought his life was over. And that's what a lot of you guys think. You think, well, God had never used me. I screwed up. I messed up. I've blown it. You know, I mean, if you killed somebody and buried him in the desert, I want to know that before we hang out. So just let's just get that out in the open Um, because you need to be behind bars and it'll make us all feel better. So anyways, but I'm glad you're here. We'll get you saved, but you're going to spend some time with a roommate. It's going to be awesome. Um, But listen, you you might have blown it and maybe you didn't kill somebody. And that's what people always say. It's not like I killed anybody. And I'm glad that makes me feel safer to be around you. But Moses blew it, man. And and so he goes and he he meets this incredible gal. Uh, Her dad's name is Jethro. He's a priest of Midian. And, you know, he doesn't really rise there. He just kind of gets stuck. He's working a dead-end job that he doesn't love. And so in, in, in Egypt, Pharaoh's considered the worst job you could possibly have. The grossest job, the most disgusting job was a shepherd. And so Moses goes from a king of Egypt to a shepherd boy. And he's out in the wilderness. He's out all by himself, screwed up his life. And this is who God speaks to. And I just want to, I want you to know this because a lot of you feel like, well, God would never talk to me. I'm not Mother Teresa. You know, I'm not Billy Graham. I'm not the next president of the United States. God is in the business of speaking to people who feel like no one sees them. That's who God is. That's what God does. So I want you to open uh, your notes or your Bibles. And I want you to look at the first two words of the story. The first two words of Exodus chapter three, verse one is this, one day. Let me give it to you in the Hebrew. An ordinary day, nothing unusual about this day. It basically could start this way. Moses was on the 91 freeway, stuck in traffic as usual, right? Bored out of his mind. Listen to that, you know, iTunes track too many times, done with it, you know, listen to all his podcasts, bored out of his mind. That's how the story begins. Nothing special whatsoever about this day. Just one day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness. Why? Because it's probably a drought. There's no, there's no where, there's no place for the sheep to feed. And so he leads them way out into the wilderness, way out of his normal path, not a, a land that he's familiar with, not a place that he knows, but he's got to take care of the livestock. So he comes to Sinai, underline this, the mountain of God. Now Moses doesn't know it's the mountain of God. He just thinks it's a random hill, but it becomes the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, which becomes the place where God meets Moses over and over again. In particular, it's a place where God eventually gives Moses this thing called the Ten Commandments. And one of the commandments is don't kill people. He's like, Moses, you need to write that down because you get angry, right? Write that down. Put it in stone. The mountain of God. Next week, we're going to talk about when a guy by the name of Elijah, Elijah, excuse me, meets God in this same place. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of the bush. God appears to him in flaming fire. The book of Hebrews says our God is a consuming fire. But what I want you to notice here is God does not consume Moses with his fire. He's not here to kill Moses. He's here to save Moses. And God is not here to kill you. He's here to save you. From the middle of the bush, it's on fire. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed with flames, it didn't burn up. It's not consuming the bush. It's simply wowing Moses. Though the bush was engulfed with flames, it didn't burn up. Moses, this is amazing, he said to himself. Why? Because he's all by himself. He can't, can't talk to the sheep. That's weird, right? He says to himself, why isn't the bush burning up? I love this line. I must go and see it, right? I mean, this is the idiot in the movie. What was that noise? I'll go over there and get killed. That's what's happening here, right? I would never do that. I hear a noise. I'm running. Moses is like, I'm going to go check it out. I'm going to take a closer look. And as he approaches the bush that's burning but not being consumed, God calls him from the middle of the bush. Moses, Moses. Here I am, Lord, Moses replied. He says, do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing, underline this, on holy ground. Now, let's be honest. You want to know what's on the ground? Sheep poo. That's what's on the ground, okay? The whole mountain is covered in sheep poo. Why? Because Moses is herding a flock of sheep. And what do they do? They eat and they poo. That's what they do. And I want you to know this. This is important. Because what makes the mountain holy isn't the mountain. It's God's presence. What will make you holy isn't you. It's God's presence in your life. You see, as human beings, we're covered in poo. It's not sheep poo, but it's our poo. And God wants you to know, look, you're never going to be perfect, but I, as a perfect God, will indwell you and I will make you holy. 
What changes a person isn't the person. What changes the person is the presence of God. And that's what every human being needs in their life. Take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. He says, I'm the God of your father. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. If you're going through a tough time right now, would you underline that? God says, I'm aware of their suffering. Do you think the people in Egypt who were slaves knew that God was aware? Probably not. But God was aware of their suffering. God's aware if you have cancer. God's aware if you're lonely, if you're depressed, if you're battling some kind of disease or you're broke. God knows what's going on in your life. And not only does he know, but he cares. Listen to what he says. So I have come down, circle this word, to rescue them from the power of Egyptians and to lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. And some of you are like, well, I'm lactose intolerant and I'm allergic to bees. Okay, that's not what it means. It's not what it means, Captain Allergy. Listen, this is what it means. Okay, what it means is you're gonna have enough food, you're gonna be fat and happy. Look, honey is as close as people could get to a Snickers bar, okay, 3,000 years ago. This is good stuff. They're saying, hey man, you're gonna eat all the food that you wanna eat and you're gonna eat all the candy you wanna eat. It's gonna be a good, good place. And that's what God wants you to do. God wants to transfer you from a personal hell into a relationship with him that is heaven. That's what God wants to do. So to become real with God, there's a couple of things I wanna challenge you to do today. Number one, if you wanna be real with God, you have to be real with who God is. And that means I must acknowledge his supremacy. You see, a lot of you believe you have a relationship with God, but you don't. You have a relationship with a spiritual pet. And God does what you think he should do. And that's why you're mad at God and you're angry with God. Because the reality is you've got you and God flipped. You are supreme and God is your servant. And I got, I got news for you. If you want a real relationship with God, God will not relate to you that way. God is God and you must become the servant. You must understand who God is. And this is what's wrong with so many religions today. God does what I want. God answers my prayers. God listens to me. And our religion is self-centered rather than God-centered. I must acknowledge the supremacy of God. This is why people say things like this. Well, I just don't believe God would ever ask me to do this. You know why? Because you don't know who God is and you don't know who you are. God is supreme. God says this in Isaiah 46, 9, for I alone am God. I am God. Underline this. There is no one like me. No one. God is supreme. Even the highest, most powerful angels, they're called the cherubim. The Bible says that they stand before the presence of God. With some wings they fly, some wings they cover their face, and other wings they cover their feet, and they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Think about that. The most powerful, beautiful, holy angels, even them cannot look upon God because he is alone and unlike any other. That's who God is. Isaiah 44, 6 says this. This is what the Lord says. I'm the first and the last. Let me translate that for you. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. God has always been. God is the unmoved mover. God is the one who has existed outside of time. God created you. God has no beginning. You're like, who created God? No one. He has always been. And if that doesn't freak you out, you didn't hear what I said. Right? When we talk about God, we should get chills on our arms. God exists in eternity. He has always been. He says, I am the first and the last. Underline this, there is no other God. And if you are worshiping another God other than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you are worshiping a false God. A God that is not real. A God that didn't create you. A God that doesn't love you. And this is why as Christians, we need to proclaim this to the world because people are worshiping things and not God. They may be very religious, but they're not worshiping the one true God. And you gotta know that Moses lived in a day and age where the, the Egyptians worshiped almost everything, including people. They worshiped their own king, Pharaoh. They worshiped him as a God. If you were married to Pharaoh, or if you were a child of Pharaoh, or a servant of Pharaoh, when Pharaoh died, guess what? You went with him. Think about that. When he died, you died. You went with him. And they bury these ancient pharaohs literally with their, all their servants, many of their wives and some of their children around them because they worship people. And God says, I don't want you to worship people anymore. And some of you worship people today. You're in love 
with a person more than you love God, you worship them. And it's going to, man, that's why earthly love betrays you. You were never meant to worship a person. You were never meant to worship a thing. Only God is worthy of your worship. I must acknowledge that God is supreme. Next, this is huge. I must understand his nature. Now, I want to encourage you this week to listen to the debrief if you can, because we're going to talk about God. And you need to know God. You need to know who he is. Because if you get this wrong, you're never going to understand what your faith is supposed to look like. You see, most people, most people who call themselves Christians or people who reject Christianity do so because they don't get God. This is who God is. God said, let us, circle the word us, make human beings in our, circle the word our, image, to be like and circle the word us. God says, I am alone in God. There is no other. There are no other gods before me. God says this, there's only one God, only one God. And yet when God talks about himself, how does he define himself? In the plural form. Let us create them in our. Why? God is trying to tell you something in Genesis chapter one of who he is. Do you know what God is? God is an eternal relationship existing of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's who God is. And listen to me. This is where, if, you, if you've grown up Muslim, you need to listen to me. Yes, there's one God. Yes, Muslims believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But what they fail to realize is that the one God is triune. And God, because of his relational nature, doesn't just want to be feared by you, but he wants to be known by you. Because God is an eternal relationship. This is who God is. I want you to notice here, how did God define himself when he met Moses? Does anybody remember? Listen to these words. I am the God of your father. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. When God meets Moses, God defines himself as the God who relates to people. Isn't that amazing? That's who I am. Why does God relate to people? Because that's who he is and that's what he wants. He wants to relate to us. In your notes, it says 2 Corinthians 3.14. It's actually 2 Corinthians 13.14. My apologies, typo. But I used to close the church with this, this verse every service when we first started. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You see, as Christians, we are baptized in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Why is this? Because as Christians, we are entering into a personal relationship with the triune God who eternally exists as three persons and yet is one. We enter into this relationship with him. And this is what Paul says to the church of Corinth. He says, I want the grace of Jesus Christ to be with you. I want God's love, the love of your father, your father who is in heaven. I want his love to fill your heart. And I never, ever want you to feel alone. I want the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the relationship with God's Spirit to be with you always. God wants us to experience Him. And what's so sad about that is oftentimes, you know what religion does? Religion makes us feel far from God and not close to God. Not this summer, but next summer. I'm going to take a, tip, a trip with our church to Israel. And I want you to come if you can. Start saving now. And one of the things I want to show you is I want to show you the ancient temple of Israel. And I always ask Christians this. I always ask them, I'm going to set you up. Just know it. I'm setting you up. I ask them, what do you see when you see the temple? And Christians get all emotional. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, it's majestic. Oh, it's amazing. And I said, no, it isn't. You know what it is? It's a cell that keeps you out. The ancient temple was levels. Only certain people could get in. And what it was, was wall after wall after wall that separated you from God. So what did God do? He tore the wall down. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, the veil at the center of the temple, the holiest of holies, do you know what happened? It was torn in two from top to bottom. Do you know what God said? No longer. No longer will you worship me from the outside. Now you will worship me from the inside because that's what God wants and that's who God is. God is relational. But if you're gonna connect with God, listen to me, you gotta know his heart, right? You gotta know his heart. I mean, guys, right, how do we fall in love with women? Their face, that's it. And they want you to know their heart. You're like, but I really like your face. It's because we're lame, guys. We're lame, right? We're lame. 
God says, look, man, I want you to love my heart. I want you to know my heart. You know what he's saying? I want you to know me. I want you to know me. I want you to know who I am. And that's who God is, right? That's who God is. And that's one of the, the beauties of women that they remind us of the nature of God. God created men and women in his image. And one of the things that women help us to do to understand God is God wants us to love his heart. And women reflect that. Guys, we don't reflect that really well, but women reflect that. I want you to know me. I want you to know me. John writes this, the one who does not love does not know God. Anybody ever met a Christian that's a jerk? Raise your hands. Don't point at him. <laughs> None of you? Raise your hand. That's like a real question. You're right, you're, you know, I just love Jesus. Come here. You know, mm. tell your face. I don't think your face got the memo that you love Jesus. I've met some really, really ugly, nasty people who claim to be Christians. Listen to me, ladies. Just because your boyfriend has Jesus tattooed on his arm doesn't mean he's in his heart. How do you know if somebody has a personal relationship with God? Because they love God and they love people. Listen to me, ladies. Don't date a guy that doesn't love God because if he doesn't love God, he won't love you. Because God is love. He is love. The one who does not know love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. God wants me to know his heart. He is love. This is why you need to worship the one true God. Because guess what? God could be almighty, all powerful, and awful. Right? What are we going to do? Protest? Like, Americans, we love to protest. What are you going to do if you protested God and he's evil? He just smite us. Start over. You know? We have rights. I mean, can you imagine? Guess what? He's not evil. He's good. And we should celebrate because what do we do if he's not? Nothing. Nothing. We must appreciate his heart. Listen, God creates in love. You know one of the things that drives me crazy? When everybody reads Genesis 1 and 2, you know what they ask? They say, is this how God created the heavens and earth? Is it six literal days? Did God create everything out of nothing? Then they ask the wrong question. You see, when you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer. Genesis 1 and 2 is not about how God did it. It's about why God did it. Right? I mean, listen to me. If you're a parent, you have kids. At some point, they're going to ask you, how did you make me? And it's just, it's awkward. And I, I thought it wouldn't be awkward. And then we had kids and you're like, <laughs> well, there's this bee. And, you know, <laughs> it's just weird, right? It's just a weird conversation. And when your kids ask you, how were they made? Answer th this way. Why were they made? Let me tell you why you were made. Because your mother and I loved each other so much that we wanted to increase that love and we wanted to share that love with someone else. So we made you. That's what Genesis 1 and 2 is about. Not how, it's why. God created the heavens and the earth. Do you know why? Because he wanted to love you and relate to you. I was listening to an atheist who's a scientist and he said this, look, he said, I don't believe in God, but I have to admit, the universe seems to be acting like it was expecting that we were coming. I don't know if you know this, but you're fragile. You're very, very fragile. It's like the earth was made just for you. And do you know why that is? Because it was made just for you. Just for you. God knew that you were coming, and so he created it just for you. God creates in love. Next, God rules in love. He rules in love. Right? People say, well, I don't understand. If God is so loving, why is there evil on the earth? Because God allows you to be stupid. That's why. Do you know what love doesn't do? Love does not demand its own way. God says you can choose to be an idiot. Here's the problem. Your stupidity not only affects your life, but it affects others. Right? If you choose to drink and drive in a car, not only can you take your life, but you can take somebody else's life who had no choice in your stupidity. That's what happens. That's why there's evil. That's why there's wrong. And thank God, thank God allow, God allows us freedom. Can you imagine if God zapped us every time we sinned? I mean, you guys would come to church on the weekends glowing. <laughs> and it's not holiness. Hey, 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 you better come forward today at the end. You know, you're just like, I know. <laughs> God rules in love. The very fact that you're alive and you're here demonstrates the fact that God loves you. If he didn't love you, you'd be dead. Can you imagine if you were God or I was God? If I was God, half of you would be dead. I'd be like, you don't tithe? Come here. Come here. 
I want you to think about this when you go out to eat this afternoon. Think of all the people that you would kill in the restaurant if you were God. <laughs> it's not murder. You're God. Right? When God kills somebody, it's just their time. <laughs> right? Think about it. Parents. Right? If you didn't love your kids, they'd all be dead. Like I used to watch National Geographic. Why do, why do wild animals eat their children? Now I know. <laughs> Tell my kids, the only reason you're alive is because I love you. Love is preventing me from killing you right now. Right? God rules in love. Next, God acts in love. If somebody says they love you, but they never act like they love you, do they love you? No. They're just manipulative and they're a liar. John 3.16 says this, for God so loved the world. I don't know about you, but I don't love the world. I have a hard time loving the people in my family. Anybody else? <laughs> like the world's got like a lot of people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Seven, eight billion people in the world today. Many of them I could do without. God so loved the seven or eight billion people in the world. Think of that. Think of the number. He so loved them that he gave his only son. God acts in love. Next, God judges in love. People say, well, I don't understand. I don't understand. If God is so loving, why does he send people to hell? Do you know why? Because he let you choose. Love does not demand its own way. Some of you right now, your life is hell. And you know why God is allowing your life to be hell? Because he's trying to give you a preview of your eternity. And he is warning you, turn around, change your life. You think it's hell now? You have no idea. You think life is bad now? What is going to happen when God pulls out and takes all his people with him? You ever heard somebody say this? I'm gonna do whatever the hell I want. You ever heard somebody say that? I mean, not you, because you love Jesus, but other people. <laughs> I want you to think about that phrase very carefully. I'm gonna do whatever the hell I want. When a person does that, is it usually good for them? Is it good for people around them? So let me ask you what eternity will be like when everybody there is doing whatever the hell they want. You know what Jesus says? Don't go there. Don't go there. You see, hell is a place of anarchy. Heaven and the new earth will be a place of order and peace. Where we live under the rule, reign, and the goodness of our king. Hell is the place where everybody lives according to their own seared conscience. Don't go there. Why does God judge in love? Because he will not force you to be with him forever. Right? I mean, would you want somebody to marry you because they had to? I only said I do because I had to. God doesn't either. He doesn't want anybody forced to be in heaven, but he calls to you from the depths of your soul and he says, come. Next, if I want to know God, if I want to be real with God, I must be clear on his desire. This is so important. This is why you need to know God's nature. God is relational. You need to know his heart. God is love. And you need to know his desire. Hosea 6, 6 says this. It says, I want you to show love. This is the prophet speaking. I want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. Listen to what God says. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. You know what religion is? Religion is dressing up the turd. That's what it is. God's not impressed. You still stink. Right? What God says is, no, no, no. That's not what I want. What I want is you to know me. Man, I... I, I beg you at some point in your life to read the book of Hosea. It's heartbreaking. Hosea is a prophet from God whom God calls to marry a prostitute. And Hosea loves this prostitute. 
cares for this prostitute, is faithful to this prostitute. And you know what she does? She cheats on him and she runs from him. She rejects his love for the embrace of men who use her. And you know what Hosea says to the people of Israel? This is how you are with God. He loves you, he loves you, he loves you. And you embrace men and women who loathe you. And God says, I don't want you to dress up the turd. I just want you to know me. I just want you to love me the way I love you. Every Jew, every Orthodox Jew begins their day with the Shema. It means to hear. It's what the, word, the Hebrew word Shema means, to hear. And the words begin like this, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Interesting. The Hebrew word for one is plural. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is ones. And listen to the great command. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Do you know what he quoted? The Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you must love him. Why? Because that's how he loves you. That's how he loves you. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. God's not interested in the religious games. He's not. He's interested in you. Luke 12, 21 says this, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Listen to me, you can have all the money in the world, you can be the richest person in this church, but if you don't have a relationship with God, you're broke. You're broke, Jesus says. This is coming from a guy who never owned a house, never made money. When they needed money, he told his disciples to go fish. He says, fish the coins in their mouth. This is Jesus, completely uninterested in money. But he came not so that you could be rich. He came so you could be rich in your relationship with God. He died not to make you financially wealthy, but to make you spiritually wealthy. That's why he came. I must be clear in his desire. Yes, a person is a fool. You're a fool if you don't have a rich relationship with God. And some of you, if you're honest, you're like, yeah, but I've tried. I don't know how to have a relationship with God. God knows you don't know how. God knows you're broken. And if you don't believe you're relationally broken, get married. I'm serious. I'm serious. And if that doesn't work, have kids. Isn't it interesting? I mean, 50% of us fail at loving the person we say we love more than any other person on the face of the earth. Do you know why that is? Because we're broken. We're broken. God knows we can't fix our relational brokenness. That's why he sent a relational solution for your relational problem. This is why you need to understand who God is. God is relational. You are relational broken. Who did he send to fix the relationship? The one that he's closer to than anyone else. His own son. The only begotten of the father. God sent you Jesus so you could have a real relationship with him. You see, you're not just relationally broken. You're relationally dead. Some of the most difficult times as a pastor I've ever had it's times when I've been in the hospital room and someone's been declared dead. Some of you have seen it on TV. I've seen it up close. It's awful. When doctors are trying to save a life, it is ugly. It almost, I mean, at times it looks like they're killing the person, not saving the person. They're working on them so hard and so diligently. And let me just say, if you're, if you're a medical professional, thank you very much for what you do because you have to operate in the most stressful situations and you work your tail off to save a life. We can give him a hand. Let me, that's awesome. But let me say this. One of the darkest, most depressing moments in my life is when I've heard the doctor say these words. We need to call it. And you know what that means? Stop. Stop. There's nothing we can do. We can't help them anymore. All their education, all their expertise, all their training, none of their effort can bring a person back from the dead. Only God can do that. And you are not relationally broken. Listen to me, you are relationally dead. And only God can save you. 
Jesus Christ came to bring you back to life, first to him and then to each other. That's why he came. He came to breathe life into you, his spirit into you to save you. For you to have a real relationship with God, I must accept Jesus as the only way to be right with God. So if you're Buddhist, Buddhism might make you a better person. It might. It might center your self-centeredness or whatever you're doing. Hinduism, it might, it, might, it might guide you morally, give you principles to live by. Islam might make you a better person. Listen to me, only Jesus Christ can make your relationship with God right. And here's why, only Jesus Christ died for you. I was talking this past week with a young man in our church who's converted from Hinduism to Christianity. And I asked him, I said, what did that process look like? And here's what he told me. He said, I'm a Hindu and I studied hundreds of gods in my religion. And he said this, none of them died for me. None of them. He said, but Jesus did. And so I love him and I will worship him forever. Jesus is your only solution because he's the only one who came. He's the only one who came for you. And people who say, I think that's ridiculous that God would only let me choose one religion don't understand what the problem is and they don't understand what the solution is. Romans 5 says this, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and what did he do? He died for us. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. That's not you. Remember, we're dressed up turds. But, verse 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, while we still stunk, while we still smelled, while we were still rotting. Christ came and he died for us. And since we've been made with, right with God in his sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Remember I said God's after relationship? Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in verse 10. For since our friendship with God, our what? Our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice. Why? Because we won the lottery? Because we never get sick? Because we never have stress? Because we're always happy? No, 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 no. Why can the Christian rejoice? The Christian can rejoice because of our wonderful new relationship with God. Why? Because of you? No, 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 no. Because of Jesus Christ our Lord, He has made us friends with God. He did it. This is the only way to have a real relationship with God. You need to do two things. Number one, repent of your sins. If you are not ready to apologize God, to God, which is what repentance is, God is not ready for a relationship with you. Right? You've got to repent of your sins, but that's not enough. Muslims repent. Hindus can repent. But shoot, a Buddhist can repent. You must repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus is the only one who died for you. And Jesus is the only relational solution to your relational problem with God. He alone is the bridge. You can complain about it, but there's only one bridge. There's only one way back to God. Jesus said, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen to this. No one goes to God the Father but by me, Jesus says. So here's the thing. God is interested in a relationship with you. Some of you are ready today, right now, to start that relationship. You know you're a sinner. You know you need to believe in Jesus Christ. You know like Moses did. You've been raised in the church. Your parents taught you and you've run from that. Or you've heard about Jesus. You have some relationship. You have some existing knowledge about God. And you're ready to change your life and give your life to Jesus. But some of you weren't raised at all. And you're feeling things right now that you don't understand, that don't make sense. You feel, you, you feel like, wow, this, this is all compelling. You almost feel like you're being, you're being led. And, and you are. And it's not by me. It's by God. God saying, yes, 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 come. But you're not sure. Here's the invitation today. If you're ready to give your life to Christ, we want to have you come forward at the end of service and we want to pray with you and lead you to Jesus. But some of you, you're not ready for that. But you have questions and you want to know more. You know something stirring in your heart and you know something that needs to change. Listen, whether you're ready to give your life to Christ or you have questions, we have an amazing small group at our church called The Path. 
It's called the path because Jesus says, narrow is the road that leads to life. And there are few that find it. We want you to find it. And so no matter where you are, we wanna walk with you in a relational process as you develop your relationship with God. And so at the end of the service, whether you're ready to give your life to Christ for the very first time, you're ready to rededicate, you need to give your life back to God, or you're just like, you know what? I want a relationship with God, but I don't know what that looks like. The path is the place for you. God is calling you, listen to me very carefully, not to make a one-time decision that never affects your life. God is calling you to begin a journey with him for the rest of your life that spills over into eternity where God teaches you about him and God loves you the way that you were always meant to be loved. God is interested in an eternal relationship with you that starts today. But it's a path and it's a journey. And God wants you to walk with him. And the way I want you to start that walk at the end of the service is by getting up out of your seat and walking forward. Something's gotta change. God's already made the move and he's waiting for you. So let's close our eyes, let's bow our heads. And I just wanna pray over you. Some of you right now need to repent of your sins and place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not look around. Let's let this be a very, very private moment for people. If you're a person here who knows you're far from God, either because of your ignorance, you didn't know him or your sin, and you want a close relationship with God that can only be found in Jesus, would you just lift your hand up so I can pray for you? Lift it up high so I can pray over you. Hold it up. No one's looking around. Anybody else? I just want to pray over you. Listen, God's hand is reaching out. All he's asking for you to do is take hold. His hand is already there. He's already done all the work. All you need to do is say, yes, God. Let me pray over every hand that's raised. Heavenly Father, you see these hands. You know their names. You know their life. You know their story. You know their hurt. You know their pain. And you know what they need. They need to repent of their sins and they need to place their faith and trust in you. Heavenly Father, help them to have the courage right now as they've had the courage to raise their hand. Bless them with the courage at the end of the service to come forward and just say, this is the decision I need to make. This is the change I need to make. Bless them, Father, with the power of your spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can put your hands down. Thank you so much for everybody who gave their lives to Christ. At the end of the offering, you're going to have a time to come forward. I love you, Sandals Church. God bless.